Good evening, church. Good evening. What a blessing to be together today. And I uh, I so appreciate it. I just want to say this. I appreciate the announcement uh, that was just made. And Kevin, you didn't know I was going to say this. Regarding those uh, in your nursing care facilities, uh, that is a very dear subject to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, last week, my 95-year-old grandmother passed away who had been in a nursing care facility and with the times that we live in, she was limited in person-to-person -person contact uh, towards the end of her stay, and she didn't understand why it was that family members could not come in the building, but had to go to her window and uh, talk to her through the window. Uh, but I appreciate you emphasizing those folks, because these are very difficult times for you and I, but could you imagine uh, being totally separated from everyone that you love? And that oftentimes is what happens in those nursing care facilities. As a matter of fact, on Facebook this afternoon, I, I turned it on just to look and kind of see what all I was missing. And there's a congregation down in Leoma, Tennessee, who had uh, gathered a group of people, Christians there from the congregation, and they had gone to a nursing care facility and outside of the window, one of the, the members' relatives was there. They had songbooks. And they actually called the individual in the room and somebody held a cell phone out while the members sang congregational hymns around the phone and the, on the inside the resident was listening to the phone. And you know what, it may sound like that's uh, not important, but I will tell you this, in these times that we live in, things like that are more important than we realize. A phone call, a visit, just to, to say that you're not alone, I'm thinking of you. You know, and we talk about social media messaging, but, you know, I mentioned also that handwritten notes need to come back. And that might be just the spark that somebody needs that day to encourage them. So thank you for making that announcement. I know this good congregation uh, obviously is aware of the needs of all individuals uh, in this congregation, as well as those who are in the nursing homes who cannot attend. So uh, I, I, I appreciate that. This evening, we're going to pick up with our series, and I want to begin tonight uh, with a concept. And that concept is uh, wrapped up in the way that you view your family. You see, there are individuals in our world today that, that view their families much like a NASCAR pit stop. I don't know how many of you are NASCAR fans. I assume none of you are. Uh, but, can you believe in the world, there are some people who are NASCAR fans, right? They love those left turns. If you were to ask and make a right, they would be confused as to what to do. However, NASCAR pit stops have always been something that I have been intrigued by. And the reason I've been intrigued is because that car pulls up going so fast and comes to an immediate stop right where it's supposed to come to. And then everybody just jumps over the wall and starts doing their thing, right? In a NASCAR pit stop, you have somebody who's whose sole purpose is to lift a fuel tank up and to refuel the car every time it comes in. Somebody else's job has the, they have the responsibility of having the, the, uh, the electric or the, the air powered wrench, right, where they will take off the nuts of the tires and then somebody else rolls a tire to them or puts a tire up so they can then turn around and zip, 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 zip and put those back on. Other individuals will make sure they rip a covering off of the windshield because it has a screen on it and all of the debris from those laps that they had uh, gone through before they pitted, that, that did a damage to that, that screen. Other individuals may check maybe if there was a bump or a crash of some sort. They may have to cut metal or pull metal off. And What's beautiful about that is, is all of that takes place with a, within a very short period of time. Because it has to take place within a short period of time. Because the more time you spend in the pits, the further behind you get. Would you believe that some people envision their family, their home, like a NASCAR pit stop? Everybody has their task. Everybody has their responsibility. The car comes in. But if they stay there too long, then they lose in the rat race of life. So therefore, there's not much time spent and therefore there's, there's ideas that have come about and, and philosophies that have been born that, that families don't really need quantity of time, they only need quality of time. I would love to know where that's found in the Bible. 
Because you know what it's founded in? Human logic. Human psychology. They say it's better for you to be present when you are there than to be there but not be there. But I would offer this to you. It's better for you to be there and be there for longer than just to get a breath from going to work or the struggles of life. You see, there's another concept that I want you to think about your home as, and, and that's where this lesson is going to. Consider your home as a castle. You see, the way you envision your home, the way you envision your family will directly influence and play into the structure of your home, but it will also play into the purpose of your home. You think about what a castle was in the time period that, that individuals lived in castles. And maybe you say, Joe, we have somebody living in a castle near us. And I would say, well, it may not be a castle, but they're pretty well off, right? There's actually a castle in Middle Tennessee along the road that bypasses Nashville. Somebody lives in that castle. That's also where they happen to have the medieval fairs and things along those lines that take place and from time to time. We've never been because... But honestly, I don't want my children to see the way the ladies dress there, honestly. But the idea is this, that there are some people who live in castles today, but most of us do not. And even those who live in castles today, they don't understand what the purpose of a castle was for. But I would offer this to you. The, the purpose of a castle was for protection, but was also a functionality concept. You think about time periods where individuals took earthenware and they would shape that, that earth into into mounds and they would create tall places even within the, the walls that were made of wood. And, and what I am reminded of regularly is that when individuals made these establishments, they did so with a thought process in mind. They thought about the what ifs. What if an enemy attacks us from this way? What if there is a need to get the people who are working the fields uh, or who are uh, doing something outside of the walls there's a need to get them in. Is there enough room inside to protect? Is there enough room inside to function? And how are we going to make this, this establishment function in a, 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 a manner that blesses all people? What you notice about uh, an early concept of a castle is that it had multiple defenses. There was not only the mound outside, there was not only the moat outside, there was a, a fence all the way around it. And then if the enemy broke through all of that, the idea was the most prominent family inside of those walls would go up on that mound of dirt. In other words, they would take the high ground. Because even if the enemy continued to attack and continued to attack and continued to break through the defenses, the concept was this. We will always try to position ourselves for the last stand in the best possible manner. I want you to think about as time would progress, they didn't change the idea of multiple levels of defense because the, the consequence of the enemy having success was serious. In other words, if they only had one wall and the enemy breached that wall, then, then what? And everybody would love to think, and you and I would love to think when it comes to our homes, that our homes will never be breached. Now, I'm not talking physically. I'm talking spiritually. The reality is this, though. Sometimes, even with our best efforts, Satan ends up weaseling his way into our homes. So tonight, I do ask you to consider this as you think about the multiple concepts behind castles. The idea of the, the structure of the, the castle, the location of the castle, the defense uh, obstacles of the castle, all of that was so the enemy would not have an easy job. When I ask you to envision your home as a castle, I'm not talking about physically. There are individuals who can tell you how to set your home up to defend your home physically far better than I could. But what I'm asking you is this. Are you spiritually ready for an attack from Satan on your home? Or is your home more like a pit stop where individuals really don't think much about what could happen spiritually? They just hurry and do their job as they're in the pits, but they can't spend much time there because then they lose. This evening, I would offer this to you that I've made the lesson pretty simple in its structure. 
And in that structure, it simply is this, that the home is designed by God for protection. And the home is designed by God to facilitate daily living that is actually a blessing to all of those who inhabit the home. And so with those two concepts in mind, I would like for you and I to consider a passage from the 127th Psalm. And I, I ask you to consider this is because tonight we have options. Tonight you have an option and I have an option. And the reality is this. We can do it our way or we can do it God's way. But we cannot do it both ways. In other words, we must choose. Will I do family God's way or will I do family according to human logic and reason? You see, because the 127th Psalm simply reads this way. Unless, you know what the word unless means, right? <clears throat> if you don't clean your room, you're not going to come eat dinner. There was no doubt the idea was this, the dad saying, unless I find your room clean, you might as well not even come to the table. That young person knows what unless means. Unless you brush your teeth, you and I are going to have problems. That person understands what unless means. The wife looks at the husband, unless you stop seeing her, I'm leaving. Everybody understands what unless means. So let's allow that, that severity, that finality to be read into this text as well. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. Unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman keeps awake in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to retire late, to eat the bread of painful labors. For he gives to his beloved even in his sleep. And I find it quite interesting that the idea is this, that there's an option tonight. One option, quite honestly, is vanity. Just like Solomon would, would, would in his search for happiness. And he had all the, the women that he wanted. He had all the wealth that he wanted. He had all the riches that he wanted. All the possessions that he wanted. He, he, he had more wealth than individuals in that, in that time that would even consider themselves wealthy. So that other individuals who were wealthy came to Solomon and said, Wow, look how much wealth he has. And Solomon's answer at the end of the day is like it's chasing after the wind. All of it is vain. It's all vanity. So you know what that means. It's chasing after the wind. So unless the Lord builds the house, and he's not talking about a physical hammer and nail and wood concept. That, obviously that's not it because God's not going to come down and put a, a nail in the piece of wood of your house. But spiritually, the idea is this. You have an option. You can either do it God's way or you can do it man's way. But you cannot do it both. You know what that means is this, that if tonight you have a concept of family and you've been doing family according to your human reason or the self-help book that you read down the road, then you're not doing it God's way. You're doing it according to man's logic. And that's why this is really that serious tonight. And so as we consider doing it God's way, let's consider this. In the area of protection, what are we supposed to protect? You know, we, I grew up playing football. By now, you've heard of uh, my younger brother who played football professionally. We, we were all big boys, and, and unfortunately, that equates to being big men. Uh, but I do remember this, that when we played football, the concept was this, that if you were on offense, you protected the football, and if you were on defense, you wanted to strip the football away from the other team. And if the football was on the ground, that's when everybody dove on it yelling, ball, 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 ball. You know why? Because whoever has the football has the chance to advance the football. And the idea of this is that as you advance the football, there's a goal in line. And, and that goal line is how you win, how you score points. And so the idea was this. When a running back had the football, the coach would tell him, you cover up with two arms when you're breaking through that line. And they would even do drills. Us linemen wouldn't do them. We were doing something else, I'm sure sweating too much but the idea was this they would have those running backs run through basically an alignment of people 
And as they ran through those people, the running backs had to cover the ball and the other people were trying to strip the ball away from him as hard as they could. Because you have to condition yourself to hold on to what matters. So spiritually, what, what am I supposed to protect? I find it quite interesting that in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, that answer is given to us when it comes to what is the most important thing within your home. You see, if there was a fire in your home, I don't know what you would go grab. Chances are you would grab memories, you would grab pictures, you would grab computers. Some of you would grab guns, but your wife wished you would just leave them there. Right? But the idea behind all of that is this. You grab what is most important to you when you believe that everything is going to be taken away. And tonight, what I want you to understand is this. There is nothing more valuable in your home than the hearts of your spouse and your children and grandchildren. That's why the Bible says in verse 23, watch over your heart or keep your heart. The New American Standard says, watch over your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the springs of life. What's beautiful about the heart as it's discussed in the Old Testament and, and as it is discussed in the New is the heart is the seed of who you are. It's not a mushy, gushy concept. It literally is this idea of the seed of your desire. If, if all of this external uh, skeleton were taken away and it was to be boiled down with who you are, that would be the Old Testament way of saying that is your heart. So you guard the seat of will. You guard the seat of decision making. You guard the seat of emotion. That's all encompassed in the heart. And why do you do that? Because from that one small entity flows behavior, flows decisions, flows consequences when it comes to making good decisions or bad decisions. That's why it's easier. I told you the other night. It's much easier for me to threaten my children with discipline and make them behave in a certain way. That's easy. It's much more difficult to turn this part of my child to Jesus. But that's exactly what I have to do. And that's exactly what you have to do when it comes to trying to maintain and trying to establish generational faithfulness. You see, and this concept is not merely stated in chapter 4, verse 23 of the book of Proverbs. You even consider Old Testament passages like Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 9, where the Bible says, Only take care and keep your soul diligently, lest you forget the things that your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart. All the days of your life. I think it's quite interesting. And then you see, make them known to your children and your children's children. The instruction of generational faithfulness. But you'll notice that it was not make sure your children memorize a Bible verse just for the sake of being able to repeat a Bible verse. Unfortunately, I have known many teenagers throughout the country in my time working with young people who could do very well on Bible Bowl quizzes. But they were the same ones who failed to connect what they did in the memorizing of the text with the Bible Bowl quiz with how they lived on Friday night. In other words, just because they remember, memorized Scripture doesn't mean it made any difference in their life. And sometimes we will emphasize the extra. You say, Joe, what am I supposed to do? I mean, obviously I want my children's faith to grow and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God, hearing by the Word of Christ. I want my children to... I do too! But it's got to be more than a mental exercise. It has got to be information that makes its way to the very core of who they are. And that oftentimes is lived out. And they will look at the example, thus the concept the other night, follow me as I follow Christ. It's because you're not just simply interested in them not cutting their own path in life. You're interested in their heart being turned to where they want to see Jesus on their own when your footprints are not in front of them. And how does that happen? It happens when we elevate what God says is the core. The seat of where the springs of life flow from. And that is the heart. It's not just in Deuteronomy chapter 4 there in that particular passage, but Moses here will go again in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verse 39. When he continues this concept and notice what he elevates and where the word of God is supposed to be. Verse 39, know therefore today and take it to your heart 
that the Lord, He is God in heaven above and on earth below, and there is no other. I find it quite interesting that over and over again throughout the Old Testament, we find an emphasis on the heart. But I would also offer this to you. It's not merely in the Old Testament. That's because this isn't locked to an Old Covenant concept. When I turn to passages like Matthew chapter 12 and verse 34, I read this. You brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. And if I go over to chapter 13 and verse 15, the Bible says, For the heart of this people has become dull. With their ears they scarcely hear, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise they would see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart and return. I look at verse 19 of the same chapter. When anyone hears these words, uh, hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one on whom seed was sown beside the road. I continue in chapter 15 and verse 8, and I begin to understand all too quickly that there's a continuation of this theme. Verse 8, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. If I look over at verses 18 and 19, it's very evident that the behavior that I see comes forth from the heart. Therefore, if I want my, my children to act in a certain way, I cannot merely deal with the externals. I have got to deal with the source of the behavior. The Bible says in verse 18, but the things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart and those defile the man. For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, slanders. These are the things which defile the man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile the man. And that needs to be reminded today of our political officials. But the idea behind that is this, that when you and I really stop to think about the heart and the thrust that is placed and the importance that is placed upon the heart. We look at passages like Matthew chapter 22 and verse 37 where the Bible says, And He said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Why is it that I tell you that when you envision your home as a castle that you identify what is the most important thing to keep? Like a football team will envision the football as the most important thing to protect. Right? Some individuals may say, that's our rally point, that's our, that's our flag. And military operations may say this, that if all else fails, all these other defenses that we have had, if they fall, one place that must not fall is this. Because if this line breaks, then the game is over. We lose the battle. And so they will say this, keep falling back. You defend that point, but if you need to fall back, then you fall back. But this line there is no falling back. I think it's quite interesting that in the Bible, the heart is identified as that which is most important within your home. The heart of your spouse, ladies. Let me ask you a question. Do you want to protect the heart of your husband? I know you do. Then I would encourage you to do this, ladies. Make sure you're intentional about protecting the hearts of your husbands. Do not go along with things that are going to allow him to, to be drawn away from you and to be drawn away from God. Do not go along with the idea that we're going to sit down together as a family and we're going to watch things that we, we should not watch. I mean, ladies, let me ask you a serious question. How many of you would love your husband to line up to watch a woman who is not dressed appropriately or not at all do things that she should not be doing on television? And you would all say this, I don't want my husband to see that. But you know, sometimes you're afraid to tell your husband that. Sometimes you're afraid to tell your husband that, that you don't want him to look at somebody else. That you want his eyes only to be for you. You know why I say that is because you have a responsibility to protect the heart of your husband. Man, you have a, a responsibility to protect the hearts of your spouse, your wife. You don't want her to be so, uh, so such an emotional draw because there's a need that is there that she opens up to the, the first guy who tells her that her hair looks nice. Or, or that she begins to entrust herself to the first man who will listen to her. Because that's how affairs oftentimes happen. For men, they're physical. For women, they're emotional. 
You want to guard the heart of your spouse, then you better listen to her. She needs you to be more than just someone who brings home a check. She needs you to guard her heart. Parents, our responsibility is to guard the hearts of our children. And I will tell you this, you better be intentional. In our home, I've already mentioned to you that we do not have television. Now, we have a TV, but we choose what to stream over that TV. But we also have on all of our devices what is called Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is an internet filter that is uh, meant to, to offer accountability uh, if individuals are struggling with pornography. Now, in our family, to my knowledge, since we started doing this, and we started doing this at a very early age for my children, none of us have ever had a report that would demonstrate a struggle with pornography. We have it on our devices because I want to protect my family. I don't want my wife to have to worry about what I'm looking at. And I don't want to have to worry if she were to go after anything. The reality is this, we don't believe it will happen, but if we, if we are lackadaisical in our approach, that's when Satan has a heyday. So we have covenant eyes. This device has covenant eyes on it. It is the internet filter. It is the, the search engine that I have. And as a matter of fact, they recently came out with screen uh, recording so that in the reports that I get every month for every one of the devices that my children have or they look at, or my own or my wife's, and she sees it as well, we can actually see screenshots of what they looked at or what I looked at or what she looked at. And it comes in a report. You say, Joe, why would I do that? Here's why I would do that. I try, Aaron and I try to guard the hearts because we know when that door is open that it's hard to shut it. Oh, one of our little boys um, get out on YouTube on a device one day before the, the screen accountability was on but it had covenant eyes. And we're not, we're not opposed to him getting on YouTube. We just want to make sure we know what YouTube he's getting on. Right? And my kids at times like watching game. It's funny because they like watching gamers play games. And so we've had to be cautious about that and really be involved in, you can watch this guy, but not that guy. You can watch this game, but not that game. And if we ever see it, then there's going to be a conversation, right? We live in a day and time, my older two kids know that if they ever get on anything, then dad gets a report. And I have told my children, you will always be better off to tell me that you were blocked from a site than for me to find it in the report. And so my oldest son will come to me, Dad, I was looking up something for school the other day, and it, it blocked me. And part of that's because of the setting that I have it on. I have it on a very low setting, and it may shock you to find out that Aaron and I have set ourselves on a teen filter. You say, well, you're an adult. Yeah, but Satan can come after me too. Anyhow, he got on YouTube, and this particular video that we said he could watch uh, was a game that every time I say this, we said he could watch this kind of video, but we had to change because there was a, a guy and a girl who were the video gamers and they were videoing themselves as they were videoing the game and every time the guy who was playing did something well the woman took off some garments I found that out on the report and it broke my heart to have to go to him. And let me tell you, he's not my oldest son. I only currently have an 11-year-old and a 9-year-old who are my two youngest boys. But I had to tell Erin, and she was, she was crushed. You know why? Because that's innocence that has been stolen. We had to confront him. He just melted in front of us. He said, I don't even want this, Dad. As he cried to give back what we had given him as one of his presents because we have kind of a stepping stone as to what we will give our children along the way to, to teach them responsibility. And he said, I don't even want this. And he gave it back. I'm grateful that we found that now. 
You know why? Because there are many 15, 16, 17 year old kids that are so far down a path. There are so many men, even men in the Lord's church, who are so far down a, a pathway of pornography that if they had been discovered that that was going on at an earlier stage, that maybe somebody could have helped them. And now they don't know what to do as they withhold information from their spouse. And children withhold information from their parents. It's the unspoken sin that we don't talk about in the Lord's church. But the reality is, the Lord's church deals with this. And I would love to tell you that it's only men. Do you know the number one growing group of individuals who are consumers of, of internet pornography are women? As a matter of fact, roughly one out of every three internet viewers are women of pornography. You look at that and you say, why would they do that? If it's all emotional, not physical, why would they do that? And the reality is this. Because through that, it draws them into an emotional tie that they are beautiful, that they can please everything that they have those desires for. And then they get trapped into a, a web of, of ensnarement. Why should we protect the hearts of our children? Why should we have internet filters? Why is it that maybe some of us need to go home and change our television subscriptions? Why is it that we would even think that Satan would not come through the biggest window and opening in our castle, which is our media habits? You know why we don't think that? Because we don't believe that Satan is really active. You know how many of us, we, we would say we do, but you know how many of us picture Satan? He's still wearing sandals and a toga walking around on a dirt road. And the reality is this, Satan has not forgotten what year it is and the technological advances. Do you really believe Satan doesn't know how to get people today? I know that you do. So how about this? As you pay attention to the protection aspect of this lesson, why don't you allow for some honest evaluation of whether or not your castle has multiple layers of defense to protect. Because I will tell you this, even with the best efforts, even with the best efforts, Satan can still weasel his way through a crack in the wall. We changed. No doubt we changed after that. But you know what? I wish it didn't have to have that in order to make us change. Some people will say we're weird. And me even telling you the things that I'm telling you, you may think I'm weird, and I'm okay with that. As last I checked in the Bible, the Bible says that we're to be holy because God is our Father. And holy doesn't mean I put on a tie and a jacket and I showed up to a church building. Holy means I choose to live differently than everybody else around me. Why? Because God is my God. And quite honestly, I will not surrender my family to Satan. Number two, I want you to think about this. If... The first point is that our homes serve as a protection. I also want you to consider that in our homes it serves as a function for, to facilitate daily living that is a blessing for all people. Now I also have to tell you this though, that God did not make a, a mistake when He created man and woman differently. Oh, I understand, we're all in the human race and we all have a soul, but let's be honest, we are not the same. Last I checked, God did not design a male body to be able to... Uh, grow a child within a womb and then to deliver the child and then feed the child from the same body. That, and I don't care what surgeries are had today and how media wants to talk about it. The reality is this. God did not design the XY and the XX to be the same. There's a divine difference in design and I am grateful that there is because there is a perfect complement we won't go into detail. There's no reason for us to. But the bodies complement each other. And that's by God's divine design. But we're not the same even when it comes to socially. You know, when you think about the needs of man and the needs of woman, our needs, uh, sometimes they overlap and they're the same, but we might fulfill them in different ways. For some men, if they have one or two close friends in their life, that's a lot. Most men don't have more than one or two close friends. They may have a lot of associates, and some men don't even have individuals that they would say are friends. Not people that have the same hobby interest, 
But I'm talking about if you needed somebody to speak straight to you and into your soul, that you don't have men in your life to do that. So as you think about it from a social concept, most men are okay with one or two. And I'm okay, you know, doing my own thing. I like getting around my guys. But you know what? Ladies typically don't act in the same concept socially. Typically it's the idea of this, that we call each other. You know, we want to talk about the day and we want to talk about uh, what we're doing to get together. And ladies seem to need the idea of the social interaction a whole lot more than men do. And, and I would offer this to you. That's not a negative that's a positive. Because ladies, let's be honest. If you didn't ask for more details, then when he comes home, you say, how was your day? And he says, it was good. If you didn't ask more questions, there might not be much more conversation. And if you didn't talk to the friends, he surely wouldn't know what was going on in the world. Because quite honestly, he doesn't care unless it impacts him directly. You see, we're different. And that's not a bad thing. That's a God-designed thing. And I know I'm speaking in, in general, general terms. So please forgive me if you say, well, that's not me. That's not my husband. I can't get him to be quiet. Well, good for you. You're right? That's a blessing. You got that guy. But the idea is this. Generally speaking, this is what those are. We're not the same in the thought process. Typically, men go into a store because they are hunting an item. And when they find that item, they come out. And then they will tell you how much they dislike going into said store. Ladies are said to be gatherers and not hunters. That's why in some department stores next to the ladies' dressing room, some of them are starting to put up big screen TVs and couches and they play sports on them. You know why? Not because the ladies like watching that. So that the men will sit down and watch the sports while their wives gather what they're going to try on in the dressing room. And they come out of the dressing room and they say, well, none of these fit. i got to go looking for more. And the man just says, would you say something? Right? It's quite interesting how different we are. I, I use a, a, an illustration. If you don't mind, I, I will. And it, it just really drives home the point we're different. When ladies tend to need to go to the powder room, I'm using that term to be, you know, where I need to be. They, they go to the powder room. It's not uncommon. I, I've got to go to the powder room. Would anybody else like to go with me? And there will be some ladies that will go to the power room as if it's a, like an outing, a field trip, right? Well, I'll go with you. I'll go with you. I have never been at a table where a man stood up and announced, boys, i got to go to the power room. Would any of you men like to go with me? I have never heard that. And we look at that and we, we, we and I'm glad you can laugh at yourselves and we can laugh at ourselves. But here's what I want you to know. God didn't mess up when He made us different. He knew exactly what He was doing when He made Eve. You know, the first time it is said in the Bible that something was not good is Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. When the Bible says it is not good for man to be alone. That's the first time something is said to be not good. God knows exactly what He is doing. And I tell you this, we need to not let culture beat us down because we celebrate what God has done. We've got too many individuals that have bought into the lie that men and women are the same before God. And I would offer this to you. Men and women are the same when it comes to the eternal destination and the same when it comes to the blood of Jesus being offered on the cross to cleanse. But there is a divine difference between men and women. You ever notice that when Adam and Eve both ate the fruit... That their punishments were different? Oh, they were both kicked out of the garden. But have you ever noticed that for Adam, it was the idea of this, that you're going to have increased uh, uh, toil and labor and there's going to be thorns and what used to be easy for you to do to, to gather food for your family now is going to be more difficult. And you notice that when Eve received her punishment, it was that she was going to have increased pain in childbearing and that she would long for her husband. In other words, she would there would be a, a submissive relationship there between she and her husband. Now, why didn't God do it the other way around? Some people would look at that and say, well, men and women are equal. So therefore, God should have given them the same punishment. And I would offer this to you. God knows exactly what He is doing. We're, we live in interesting times. We're actually on our fourth wave of feminism in America. And we live in a time period where people will say this. They will say, if women choose to be stay-at-home mothers, 
that they are, they are uh, allowing themselves to be suppressed. Individuals who choose to be married and submit to their spouse or a husband who chooses to, to not bash his wife in front of his friends but to talk up about his wife that he is whipped is our terminology. Boy, she's got you whipped. And we will use all kinds of derogatory terms when it comes to individuals trying to be what God would have them to be. And I want you to hear me say this. In the Old Testament time period, the Jewish woman was elevated. And she was elevated because the pagan women used to look at the way God's covenant people treated their women in their, in their relationships and they longed to be that. It did not mean that the women in the Jewish religion ever stepped above or that they were supposed to step outside of the lines that God had intended for Jewish wives and mothers to be. But it just showed you how much more desirable it was to have a loving relationship where you could tell that both were seeking the fulfillment of one another than what they experienced in the pagan world. You and I live in times where Individuals will say, well, men and women are equal. And I find it quite interesting, and I'll be quiet on this after this one. America doesn't believe men and women are equal. And I'll tell you why. Number one, if a husband decides he doesn't want the, the baby, the husband cannot kill the baby. Only the woman can go kill the baby. Men and women are not equal. But we're not equal in this fact either. Do you know we have what is called a draft in America to serve in the military. And there's been talk amongst some political elites that if we're going to say that men and women are equal in America, then at the time that every one of my sons has to register for the draft, that my daughter also should have to register for the draft. Do you know that women don't have to register for the draft in America today? But men do. And I don't believe that's going to be changed anytime soon. You know why? Because we as a, as a nation still cannot stomach forcing young women to go into the military. But we don't have a problem with them volunteering, which if they want to volunteer, that's, that's fine. But my question is this. If we really believe men and women are equal, why do we not force them to enter into the draft? And see, when I tell you that, some of it turns your stomach because you have granddaughters I saw a precious little one-year-old daughter out here today. Is it Payson? Yeah. I don't know what she's going to desire in her life. But can you imagine Payson being forced to carry 80 pounds of, of materials and to carry a machine gun into war, not because she chose to, but because she had to. You see, I believe God made men and women differently. You know that men and women don't have the same muscle mass? Do you know that men and women don't have the same, can I say this, fat mass? And that's by design by God because the female body needs what God designed the female body to need. You know that when God speaks of a man, He speaks of a man in a way that is leading His family, a way that He is actually, uh, and I want to show you this, He's guiding and He's protecting and He's providing. That's the way the Bible speaks of a, of a man within the family concept. Can you imagine a, a home today where, where a husband and a wife are in their, in their bed, they're sleeping and the children are in the other room and somebody breaks into the, to the house and the husband leans over to the wife and says, hey, go get your baseball bat. Somebody's in the house. That's a man who's going to be sleeping on the couch for the rest of his life. As a matter of fact, I would rather say this. There are many men who may be the physical uh, intimidation of Steve Urkel. Right? You remember Steve Urkel? But when they believe their wife or their children's lives are at risk, they will turn into Rocky Balboa real quick. Because it's something that men protect our wives. We protect our homes. And I will tell you this, the first one to die in my home, if there's going to be someone to die, if it wouldn't be that other person, it's going to be me doing everything I can to protect my family. Because that's what God intends. That's His divine design. You see, when you think about women, though, I would offer this to you. Biblically speaking, women are not spoken of as the same as men. 
And I know this is not popular. And I know that if people were to, to read this, can you believe what that Church of Christ preacher said? He is such a pig-headed individual who believes that men are better than women. And I would offer this to you. No, I don't. I play board games with a lot. I can't do what wives can do with what ladies can do. I know some ladies that would, would be able to, to, to speak about the Bible. They would speak circles around me with their biblical knowledge, with their logic. This isn't about who is superior. This is about what is God's design. When the Bible speaks about women, I find it quite interesting that a passage like Titus chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good, so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands, so that, why, why? So that the Word of God will not be dishonored. You see, at the end of the day, it's not about who's better, it's about is God glorified? Is His Word elevated? And you look at this, and I know, look, I, I believe in Proverbs chapter 31. I believe in a Proverbs 31 woman who brought in an income for her family. And I, I do not, I'm not the guy who says, I'm going to say that that's a sin to bring in an income. But I want you to hear me today. I, I need you to hear me say this. Because a woman brings in income to her home, it does not negate what Titus chapter 2 teaches. And husbands and men, we need to be aware of this too. If we each have our own responsibilities within the home, but yet there is a requirement or a need, which by the way, since I'm getting on an airplane, I can say this. Do we really need three cars? Do we really need them to be new cars? Do we really need to eat out as much as we eat out and have a mortgage as much as we do and have the internet package that we have and the phone package that we have and the cable package that we have? Because that's what we say. Well, she had to go to work. Is it possible that we live too high on the hog? You know what that means? Is it possible we live too high on the hog? And that's why she had to go to work. Now, I would offer this to you. She should get in your face and tell you, what do you think working at home is not work? The reality is this. A man is designed by God to fulfill a certain role, and so is, his, so is the woman. But when the woman then has to work, men, we need to understand, it doesn't take away this foundation, what it does is it compounds the amount of stress and weight that she is asked to bear. You actually could be putting more on her. You need to consider that next time you have that discussion. Because I will tell you this, there is nothing dishonorable about a wife who stays home and raises the children. There is nothing dishonorable about a wife who understands what it is to be a worker at home. I find it quite interesting that the Bible says that older women, older women are to teach these younger women how to love their wives, love their children, and to be workers at home. Maybe that's where we failed. Maybe we failed from generation to generation. Because let's face it, what generation is speaking truth to the current generation of young wives today? Was it not a generation that rebelled against governmental authority? Was it not a generation that said that, you know what, we're going to rise above and not be oppressed? I find it quite interesting to study what it, I call the hippie movement, but some people call it the free love movement. The reality is this, generations have a responsibility to generations. And we should not look at younger generations and wag our finger at them. We should look at older generations and say, were you fulfilling your God-given directive as well? I never understood how a, a wife needed to be taught how to love her children. You know, in my mind, that's just one of those things that happens, right? You bear the child, you love the child. But there's something about how do you love the husband and how do you love the child when they're not lovable? I tell you, there's more to the Bible than just did I show up to church and put money in a plate and take communion. There's a whole lot more to being a disciple. That's why even when I think about young people, I will offer this. Young people, you are not exempt from the teachings found within the Word of God. If you expect your father to be what God has called him to be, you expect your mother to be who you, your mother is called to be, then guess what? You have to bear that same understanding. 
And as young people, it is evident. Places like Colossians chapter 3, verse 20, Children, be obedient to your parents. And in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. I find it quite interesting that in other passages, we'll talk about how children are to respect and to honor their parents in all things, not in some things. Not when they say what I want them to say, do what I want them to do. Not as long as they let me play the video game, as long as they will, or let me have the phone or the car whenever I want it. The idea is this, in all things. And why? Because this is honoring to God. Your dad doesn't deserve your obedience. But he's been placed in your life in a position by God. So honor God by respecting your father. Your mother doesn't deserve your, your love and obedience. But she's in a position in your life because that's where God placed her. So honor God by respecting your mother. When I think about the idea of honoring, sometimes it's hard to... To put words to that. And, and I love the idea of word pictures. And, you know, and the reason I do that is because some people believe, well, I did what they said. What do you mean I didn't honor? You ever known a child, none of your children or grandchildren, but can you believe in the world some people struggle with this, right? You tell the child to go to the room and they go to the room and then they slam the door. Bam! Well, I went to my room. I obeyed you. You tell the child, take the garbage out and the whole way out to the end of the driveway, the son, I can't believe Dad. Well, I did what you said. But the question is this, but did you honor? You see, honor is a whole other concept. And the best way that I could reveal to you and relate to you what honor means is to show you this picture. If you've ever had the chance to go to Washington, D.C., to Arlington National Cemetery and to to be at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, you understand what it means to honor. Those soldiers will prepare to enter into what is a special forces unit within the military. They will have to study the, the prominent individuals all over Arlington and they will have to be able to tell those stories and to take a test. There's memorization that occurs over a, a multiple pages and it's my understanding that when they take their test, they not only have to be able to relay the information, they have to be able to put the punctuation exactly in the place that it was given to them in their manuals. It has been said they will spend hours dusting their boots, shining their boots, taking the lint off their jacket, shining their medals, making sure the medals are placed at the exact place that it's supposed to be, the hat at the exact point that it is supposed to be. The gun is an active gun. That gun is a loaded weapon. But it cannot have residue. And so they will shine that gun. They said they spent hours to get ready to go spend 30 minutes walking a piece of carpet. It's 20 steps from one end of the carpet to the next because a 20-gun salute is the highest honor that we can give those who have fallen. They will pause at the end of the carpet for 20 seconds because it's the highest honor, a 20-gun salute that they can have. That gun is always between an audience and the tomb. And I've actually seen, you can go on online and look at individuals who enter into places at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier that they're not supposed to be. And those soldiers will step off, they will bring their gun down, and they will yell at the people who are out of line. They will yell at the audience and instruct them that they will be quiet while they are there. You consider all of that and I ask you this, why do they do that? Why is it year after year we lay a wreath why do we even have a box? Because after all, isn't that just a box? Isn't it? I mean, after all, isn't it just a box? And you and I both know the answer. No, it's not. The Tomb of the Unknown Soldier represents everyone who never came home. Everyone who was unidentifiable. All of those who paid the ultimate sacrifice, yet their families never had closure. That's why there's a soldier in the old guard who from the time of its inception has always walked to guard. Even when you're sleeping in your bed tonight, there will be a tomb guard soldier standing his post. They've had opportunities. I don't know if you know this. They've actually had opportunities to not stand post in times of, of very bad weather. But one of the things that the tomb guard soldiers pride themselves in is this, that they've never taken a break even when the weather was bad. And I ask you why. And the answer is because that's what honor looks like. I show you a picture here, and it's a dated picture. My children continually tell me, Dad, you need to get a new picture. And I tell them, be quiet. This is how I'm going to remember you, right? 
I don't want to remember you as the hairy, upper-lipped teenage boy who needs to shave. I want to remember you as this guy. But I do need to get another picture. This is my wife, Erin. The oldest boy there now is uh, going to be 17 next month. His name is Colton. That's our little red-headed princess. Her name is Michaela. She's 15 now. The little red-headed boy there, he is our, he's the one that loves and he wants to make you laugh. He is the one that's always coming up saying, you need a hug. His name is Camden. And he's our jokester. The little guy there, his name is Bennett. And I do believe he's tougher than nails. He will accomplish whatever he wants to accomplish. He's a very smart boy, but he's very driven. But he's also very obedient in his desire to please his mom and dad. I have been blessed with a godly wife. And I have been blessed with four healthy children. And as the leader of my family, I understand something. That a line must be drawn in the sand. And I must say what Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I must understand that a choice has to be made. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Because what I understand is this, that the enemy doesn't take a break just because I get tired. Do you know that just because you want to let your guard down doesn't mean Satan's going to say, okay, I'll give you a reprieve tonight. I won't come after you tonight. That's not the way Satan works. So the reality is this, a line has to be drawn in the sand, and it's a hard line. But it is a declaration from the top down that in my house we will serve the Lord. That's why when my children, from time to time, my children do this and we talk about, you know, my children sometimes get a lot of church services in. Because it may be they get three in on a Sunday and then they get one Friday night, Saturday night. Typically I'll come in and do a Friday night, Saturday night, all day Sunday, and then we'll leave on Sunday evening. But on gospel meeting week, sometimes I come in on a Sunday and do three on a Sunday and then do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday nights. And I would love to tell you then typically it's that we go home and then we just get back to normal. The problem is for, for that concept, my normal is I start another gospel meeting on Sunday. So in a given week, my children will get six services and then start next Sunday, they pick up again. You look at them and say, oh, you're torturing your children. That's what they say because I'm the preacher. So from time to time, it may even happen within my home where my children would say, Dad, do we have to go? And I'll say this to them, no. No, son, you don't have to go. You get to go. Now get in the car, we're leaving. <laughs> right? And there's a difference between have to and get to. I want my children to always look at service to the Lord as I get to do this. Not I have to do this. I will end this way tonight. You've heard of what's called Point Man. There's a book that is out, and I mentioned to some brothers here before about the, the benefit of having a men's ministry. And I would highly encourage you all to think about having a men's ministry, but being devoted to it as well. There's a book called Point Man by Steve Ferrar. And in that particular book, he uses a, an illustration from the Vietnam War. Of when the soldiers would go into the jungle, they would spread out. The platoon would spread out much like a geese flying in the air. And at the, the tip of that V, there was what was called the point. And somebody always had to walk point. But the point man did not walk right with everybody else. The point man would walk ahead of everybody else. And the point man had a very specific purpose, and that was to listen intently away from everybody else to possibly the enemy uh, ready to ambush the platoon. The, the point man had to keep an eye open for uh, traps that had been set, trip line that had been set. And here's what's significant about those who walked point. Those who walked point, if they failed their job, then the platoon would suffer. And there were many platoons in Vietnam who went into the jungle and never came back. Not a single one of them. And I don't want to put that all on the point man, but I know this much from the studies of military history. That point man, if he didn't pick up on the potential dangers, then everybody behind him would walk forward assuming it was okay. Men, you may say, man, I'm ready for him to quit talking to us. <laughs> Men, you are the point in your families. If you fail, if I fail, 
then my family will suffer. Tonight, my prayer is this, that you will not see your family and your home as a NASCAR pit stop. But you will see your home as the castle to protect the hearts and as a function of daily living to do family God's way. When we do it God's way, there will be God's blessings. When we do it man's ways, we will always be disappointed. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are so good to us and we are grateful that we have the opportunity to slow down and to discuss topics related to your scripture and related to family. Heavenly Father, we do want to approach family in a way that honors you, in a way that you would have us to do it. Lord, I pray that you strengthen my brothers in this room. Many of us may not have had fathers that led in the way that you demand and command for men to lead. And so maybe they are first generation. They would be called anchor men. They're the ones that are striving to, to lead in a manner that they didn't have an example. And so, Lord, I pray that you would let them, let them understand and to know your will by studying of your word, but also to understand that you would not require that of them if they were not able to fulfill that purpose. Lord, many of my Christian sisters in this room may not have had mothers that were the ladies that you call Christian women to be. And I pray, Lord, that you strengthen these ladies. Let them know that the world will say a lot of things and just because the world says it doesn't make it so. Help us to seek your glory above our own, even our own comfort and our own desires and our own drives. And Lord, for the young people in this room, I pray they would understand that there is no free pass and that accountability, that it's real. And I pray, Lord, they would come to understand and to put into practice what it means to honor and obey and respect their parents. Lord, please be patient with us. We desperately want to be the families you would have us to be. Please be patient with us as we strive to that end. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.